Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Doyle, this is The Vertigree Table, and today we're talking about mountain encounters. Now, unlike a lot of dungeon masters out there, I really like random encounters and overland travel and exploration. Usually my players don't realize it's a hex crawl, but it's a hex crawl on my side of the screen. Um, and the way that I have made that awesome for myself and for my players and created a feeling of this open world sandbox where anything can happen and you pull on a single thread and story pops out is by working very hard to make these encounter tables and today i have polished up and made presentable uh my tier one mountain encounters and i'm going to show them to you now the way this all works is it's a table, surprise, surprise, and it is a 2d6 table. And that gives us, It's technically it's not a bell curve, but it might as well be a bell curve that helps me think about it. It's a little pointier. Um, so you are getting the middle numbers the most. So think of like Settlers of Catan, right? Six, seven, and eight are gonna happen more often than not. And typically what I will do is I will actually have the players rolling the check and it's not roll a d20. And if it's an 18, 19, or 20, something happens. Something always happens. But I know about half of the time what's gonna happen is under the six, the seven, or the eight slot. So six is going to be conditions, right? Weather stuff for the most part. It's going to change what happens next, right? So if I roll a six and then the next check gives me a creature, an encounter, something, it's happening during uh, strong winds or giving me disadvantage on ranged attack rolls because it can get real windy in the mountains. Um, seven is actually role play prompts, these questions that will hopefully bring people into the mindset of their characters and maybe develop, um, one, their role play chops a little bit better, but to develop their characters a little bit better. It's not, hey, what is your strength modifier? It's what secret have you been holding on to? And do you share it in this moment, sitting around the campfire, you know, getting ready to make dinner and have your long rest? Or, you know, are you afraid of heights? There's there's context here. And there's more context as we go through this because there's there's more to it than just this table. But if you're in a rush or it's your personal preference, you can just ignore the rest of this product and use this table and you'll see it packs way more of a punch than your typical random encounter table, right? So under eight, 1D, four giant goats, right? And that's a pretty standard uh, entry for a random encounter table. Okay, it's thematic, these are mountain goats, cool, but you get a, even on the table itself, before we do the deep dive, you're getting just a little more flavor, right? 1D4 giant goats, heavily muscled and excellent climbers. I don't know if you've ever seen a mountain goat or seen an image of a mountain goat on a sheer rock face, climbing a cliff, like it's a staircase, I, they're, it's incredible. Um, and if you get up close and personal with them, they are swole, and I wouldn't want to fight one. So mind your P's and Q's around those guys. Um, so that's the bulk of it. Kind of uh, uh, an elevated version of your typical random encounter table. But that's really only half of what's going on in here and it's the other half it is the more let's call them unusual or unlikely unprobabilistic outcomes which are still going to happen roughly half of the time where we get the the juice so if you roll snake eyes right if you roll two ones and you get a two and again i like to put it in the player's hands so they are controlling their fate and so they can see oh boy we rolled bad oh another random encounter Dolly says hi, but she doesn't want to be on camera. So let's say that the players roll a two, or sometimes I'll actually have like two players roll a d6, and they roll a one, and then they roll a one, and as your players become more and more familiar with my work, they will start to worry about the outcome because they know something's coming. And in my home game, it's pretty much always a dragon. Um, and some of these earlier tables, I've taken a little bit easier on folks, um, but there have been, you know, CR four, five, six. Uh, I've kept a giant themes in the lowlands because I don't want to cause a TPK for you. But in this one, it's a wyvern and they could, 
consider themselves lucky that it's just a wyvern. But finding a wyvern on, let's say, a five or ten foot wide path in the mountains where there's a very steep drop off on one side and a wall on the other, that's going to be an interesting fight, yes? Um, the other side of the coin to counterbalance it whoops, is a restorative spring. So they find this location which they can return to um, and drinking from it directly or submerging yourself within these healing waters acts as the spell Greater Restoration, which especially at Tier 1 is a nice thing to have access to. If you bottle the water and take it back with you, okay, it is less potent, but it's still casting lesser restoration. You've essentially got a potion of lesser restoration. And as your players begin to learn that there are positive results, right? Pulling a random encounter doesn't just mean a fight that is going to sap their resources or maybe worse, be completely inconsequential because they're going to blow through it and use all of their, they're going to go supernova and then take a long rest because it doesn't matter what happens because it's just a random encounter on the road. But when they gain the benefits of a random encounter and now mark it on their map because they want might want to come back here, now the wheels start turning and maybe they want to explore this region because the the other thing that this is and what this really is it's formatted as a table but it's a box of legos it's a box of bricks that you the dungeon master can arrange and put together in any way you want right you can roll the dice you can have the players roll the dice to determine what happens or you can just pick something and what is happening here as we dive in deeper because all of these entries actually get much more fleshed out in the following pages, right? So even the Wyvern, which is a pretty standard bestial, not very intelligent, you know, here's a couple paragraphs and, you know, if you have the time in prep, I mean, it's not a huge document. This is eight pages and two of those are covers and one is the table. So a short amount of reading to get all this in your brain, you're going to know what's going on in these mountains when you sit down to run them, and you're going to start to see all of the connections, and I hope make some of your own, because what has happened in these mountains, not that long ago, but before the players get here, a wizard has come up here to seek seclusion and practice some dark magics. A tale as old as time, an elf is getting pretty old, you know, she had a good run, a thousand years, I don't know, what does an elf live? 1200 years? But she wants to live forever. Understandable, sympathetic motivation. Um, so the first thing she does is she summons a couple elementals. She actually opens a gate to the plane of air, the elemental plane of air. And don't worry, there isn't an entry for that. It can be there if you want it to be there. But, you know, having your level two characters on the way to the dungeon discover a portal to essentially another dimension is, you know, could be a lot of fun, but it could also be uh, a real bummer for a dungeon master who has to throw out all of their prep and invent, you know, a land without earth. Speaking of Earth, um, the much more friendly elemental, and by friendly I mean neutral and not openly hostile as this air, element, air elemental is, um, who will swoop in out of nowhere, throw some people around, and like consider themselves lucky if they hit their friend behind them or a boulder or something, because the alternative is a few thousand feet of a drop, right? For practically gods. But the... Other elemental in play is the Galab Dur, which is a, a word I am uncomfortable saying out loud on the internet because I don't know how this is supposed to be pronounced, but Galab Dur is what I've said at my table um, forever. It sounds like um, a dish that I would like to sample, but uh, this creature is way more neutral, way more hospitable. He is willing, or she, or they, I believe they, I don't know if there's a gender here, um, they are willing to talk to the characters, but they only speak Terran, which is an interesting challenge, and they speak incredibly slowly. Imagine an Ent times, you know, a million. So maybe that triggers that one player at the table to make a snide remark 
And this Golub Door takes offense and animates two boulders up above. And then, boom, they are fighting three of these things as they come rolling down, smashing into the party. But the meat of this story, in my opinion, your mileage may vary. Make it your own. I deeply encourage you to make this your own. Is this fine lady right here, the Banshee. This is what remains of that elven wizard. Um, she had found a bunch of dark little nooks and crannies because when we think about mountains we think about peaks but there is a low for every high and there's a lot of little ravines and caves and crevasses and valleys right hollows hollers um where the sun don't shine um where you have a tiny slip of slip a tiny slip of sky above you and depending on what side of the mountain you were on the sun may never enter that sky above you. And it was in these places where she set about to experiment. Actually, the first uh, thing that she did in my head canon after summoning these elementals to protect her was to go into this cave um, and create some crawling claws. And what happens is our players walk into this cave and they see 1d20 skeletons. And if I, the dungeon master, show you a skeleton, you are waiting for it to animate, and you breathe a sigh of relief when it doesn't, and that's when you go try to loot them. And that is when you learn that none of these skeletons have hands, and that's when we roll for initiative because a whole swarm of crawling claws come crawling <laughs> at the party. And a crawling claw is a very low threat, very easy to hit, very easy to kill, doing very little damage, but you throw, what, 20 on average, 22 on average at the party, that's going to be an interesting encounter, no? Send them in in waves. Um, but yeah, it's a numbers game, right? The action economy is in shambles. Um, the other things that she has done is created shadows in this boulder field. So you're making athletics checks just to move through here. And there are little places to hide if you're a shadow, little dark spots beneath all of these stones. And that could be a heck of a fight. Talking about punching above your weight class, shadows, sapping strength, changing a character's ability scores, right? Players are ready and willing to give up hit points, right? That's the bargain. I mean, to a degree, <laughs> right? They don't want to, but they're used to losing hit points because they know they come back so fast. But attack their other assets, attack their ability scores, and it's going to feel very different for them. Um, you also have a single poltergeist in a valley that is unhollowed ground, so they have advantage on all of their saves. Um, plus they are invisible, plus they're psionic, basically. They're, they're using telekinesis. Poltergeists I don't see enough. They're a lot of fun. And roll the right number, and you're facing off with the Banshee herself. And throughout all of this, I have these little blocks of, like, DM notes. I mean, this is all a DM note at the end of the day. It's all a, a love letter to you dungeon masters out there. But in these blocks, I have a little more abstract and a little more uh, of a personable tone. Um, trying to encourage you to do other things with this table and beyond it. Um, so, for instance, this one, though she may be just another obstacle to overcome as the party passes through these mountains, the Banshee could be the reason they come here and an integral part of progressing a quest. In life, she opened doors to other planes, and in undeath, she may still know the location of a lost artifact, an ancient ruin, somebody's secret identity, or any other piece of knowledge relevant to your campaign. So, she's there and you can use her because you know, a little bit of flattery, perhaps, a little bit of negotiation, and she could be pivotal to getting the party from A to B or finding the magical MacGuffin. Um, five, you're going to get some hazards, right? So maybe altitude sickness or the path goes out from under you or the path above you goes out. Um, or, for instance, if you roll a four, the trail suddenly ends at the foot of a stone cliff. A successful DC 18 group athletics check is required, or the party must double back and lose one day of travel. Each climber's kit grants advantage to one character. So if they prepared for their journey in the mountains, it's going to benefit them. 
So one thing I'm doing in this table is trying to focus in on some of these tool proficiencies and skill sets and equipment that don't necessarily see a ton of use because if the player character or the player really invested the time and energy to choose to prepare for going into the mountains, I want to reward them for that. I want to encourage them to think about the game holistically. Um, so for instance, let's slide on down. We already talked about six, seven, and eight and how swole goats can be. And I, I just really love this hippogriff that looks like a pigeon. Did you see the other one? Let's go see the other one for a second. These hippogriff images that I found, I don't know, they make they make me happy. Because, you know, pigeons are actually rock doves. I mean, I'm from New York, so we consider them trash birds, but they were actually like birds of royalty with their like iridescent oil slick necks. Ooh, pigeons, man. Sorry, tangent. That's what you get sometimes when you're having random encounters, random conversations about random encounters. There's our crawling claws. But speaking of utilizing toolkits and proficiencies and supplies, um, rolling a 10, and high number's good. The players will learn more or less most of the time, so potentially good. Let's put it that way. Um, rolling a 10, and then you roll a d6, and you stumble upon one of these useful alpine plants so alpine speed well when a creature consumes this they can dash as a bonus action for one minute so maybe it's a nature check to identify this a survival check perhaps but nature feels right um but processing this with an herbalism kit or alchemist tools creates a potion that doubles a creature's movement speed for one hour so there are it's good on its face but there are additional benefits that you can unlock if you were to have proficiency with one of these kits or at least have invested in one of these kits and you carried it up here and i want you to feel good about that decision uh compass rose which uh, maybe it's not as clever as i thought when i wrote it but uh when brewed as a tea this grants advantage on survival checks and the drinker can't get lost for 24 hours depending on the kind of campaign you're running that might not be much of a benefit but if we're like in a hex exploration type of thing and we're getting lost in the mountains moving at half speed that could be a very good thing to have but combine it with cartographers tools or navigators tools and this t acts as the spell find the path so put this in your pocket save it for a rainy day when you are trying to find the lost tomb of the, the magical guy and yeah could be a very useful thing to have ink berry produce 1d8 times 10 gold pieces worth of fine ink super great to find if you're a wizard otherwise boom cash that in for some gold but use this with calligrapher supplies or painter supplies allows one casting of the spell illusory script or sky right and i really like that because those are cool flavorful spells that you can do very interesting things with that like I, most people are not going to prepare, right? Because it, it's it's very situational. But if I know I've got one use of Skyrite in my pocket, then like, depends on the kind of player you have, right? Some players are going to hoard those consumable items and never use them, but other players are going to look for opportunities to use Skyrite in an impactful way. And if you're one of those players and you're watching this, thanks for that. Um... And 11, the other side of this equation, the other faction in play here are the Aracocra. And I always say Aracocra, Aracocra, I believe is how you say it. But again, pronouncing things on the internet, uh, comment down below and yell at me. Uh, <laughs> but the Aracocra are here because that wizard opened a gate to the elemental plane of air. And they are now guarding it because they don't want any of us riffraff from the material plane wandering through and, you know, breathing their air or whatever we would do, probably falling forever. Um, so you can roll an encounter with six of them and they are neutral, right? They are not necessarily just going to attack the party, but they are going to be suspicious. What are you doing here? Are you trying to invade our homeland? You armored and armed magic bearing people way far from home, close to our home. What's up? And if the party is impolite, obviously this could be a fight. And if it is a fight, they may discover that half of this band attacks in melee and half of the band stays in the air and one of those people one of those bird people 
has uh, the eyes of the eagle, giving them advantage on perception checks, and two of them have gloves of missile snaring, making these relatively low CR creatures quite a bit more formidable, because, you know, if that high wind is blowing and you have disadvantage on all of your ranged attacks, and if you do manage to hit with a crossbow bolt and they are reducing the damage of that attack, potentially down to zero, ooh, maybe you're going to rethink negotiating and being nice to these avian potential friends, because they are potential friends. These are an intelligent people who you can negotiate with, who could give you directions, could give you information, perhaps sell you one of these magic items instead of, you know, attempting to loot it off of their dead body. And if you shoot a bird person out of the air and they're, you know, 40, 50 feet away from you and they fall home and you're in a steep mountain landscape, acquiring that magic item might be a, an encounter, a challenge in its own right. Anyway, um, the other thing these Arakokra are doing, if you may come upon them, is doing this odd ritualistic dance. And I was considering getting even more uh, juice into this one. Do you read box text? Let me know in the comments. I've recently started to read box text again. Not every time, not most of the time, honestly, but like once or twice a session now, I will read the box text because... Well, because I haven't in a long time, I dismissed it, really, and sometimes it's good. Um, but get descriptive with this one. Whirling on an updraft, five Aarakocra form a ring and perform an odd ritualistic dance. They are summoning an air elemental, which is friendly to them, but hostile to the party and likely to attack. Now, do the Aarakocra intervene on the party's behalf with this air elemental that they're controlling maybe it depends what the party is doing or what you the dungeon master feels like honestly but typically i like to leave the ball in the player's court um and now here's that restorative spring again and in this final page um beyond explaining you know how to use the benefits of the 2d6 and how to just roll a d12 and wing it and flatten that curve completely and make that wyvern equally as likely of an outcome as the, you know, hey, what does your character want to tell us about themselves today? Um, I've also included a batch of hooks because, again, th these are uh, not necessarily instructions, but like pictures on the box of Lego bricks for things that you can assemble with this. Um, so if you want a little more structure if you want to give your players a little more of a reason for exploring this place, because you want to get more use out of this table, then, for instance, an apothecary needs a rare herb that only grows at high altitudes for a new potion they are concocting. So a little fetch quest, probably with an added benefit of like, hey, you get this potion at the end or some gold or something. Uh, the Valley's farmers have come together to offer a bounty on a wyvern that's been feeding on their livestock. Ooh. Uh, the party is hired by the local peacekeeping force to acquire a hippogriff egg. And let's talk about the fact that canonically, Forgotten Realms lore hippogriffs don't lay eggs. But why Why not? They should. Because there's uh, an encounter where you find an egg, and it could be a hippogriff, and it could be a wyvern, and it could be an arachocra. Do they lay eggs? They do in my world. You decide what happens in yours, but uh, the party's hired by the local peacekeeping force to acquire a hippogriff egg so they can raise and train it for a mount. An eccentric noble offers to double their price. So already you have uh, two factions, right? A conflict. Do we want to align with the local guards, right? The city watch, whatever it may be, the lawful good peacekeepers here, and probably gain some benefits and access because of that relationship or do we want to make more money and align ourselves with this eccentric noble who may further provide us with high paying quests or third option do we keep this egg for ourselves and try to get us a flying mount and there's a little box about if i give you a thing that flies and it's not instantly trying to kill you even if it is instantly trying to kill you for some players someone's going to try to ride it and make it their friend so the suggestions on how to deal with that you can just say no that's an option too uh, one more the magical waters of a legendary mountain spring may be the only cure for a mysterious disease that's spreading so here is this difficult to find resource high up in the mountains and perhaps you have to brave several of the things or most of the things on this table in order to acquire it because 
the difference between a dungeon and and you know biome, right? A, a hex or a hex map is a little more abstract than you think, especially if you're trying to really bend over backwards to make your dungeon non-linear. Go outside. <laughs> it would benefit all of us. We should all spend more time outside in fantasy and in the real world. Um, and the last little thing other than like, hey, that's my name. Uh, I'm giving you some other names because, in my opinion, m more than most, if not all, environments, biomes, mountains require names. You know, what is this peak? What is this valley? It's not just one endless plain of grass. It's not just you know, one tree after another. It's not just a swamp. There are a lot of distinct things in this place. So I give you a bunch of names that you can use for high points and again, low points because Dragon's Tooth, Titan's Seat, like those are things that I think of when I think of mountains, the Misty Peak, uh, Kevin's Karn. Um, but they're going to go through mountain passes and gaps and chasms. So we have Dead Man's Pass, right? The Giant's Stair, Hell's Gate, uh, the Toothy Maw. <laughs> so, yeah, I hope you get a lot of mileage out of this. Come let me know in the comments if you do um, what you're looking for in the next one. We got a couple more environments to talk about before we start making tier two environments, which I'm excited about. In the meantime, if you like this or you're not going to the mountains today, maybe check out our forest encounters or our grasslands or our hills, which are starting to become best sellers, folks, which is very exciting. I'm getting some medals on Dungeon Masters Guild, and it's thanks to your support. So big appreciation for you watching this through to the end. Go check this out on the Dungeon Masters Guild. If you're not there already, there is a link down below to all of that. And again, thank you so much for watching. Be kind, have fun, and we will see you next time. Bye.